This first the first body has been established since 1968. The creation of the faculty was meant to stimulate growth and allow for meaningful and independent development and expansion of the disciplines of mathematics, biology, chemistry, physics, statistics, and also computer science. The vision of the Faculty of Science and Mathematics Diponegoro University is become an excellent research faculty with international reputation in the field of science and mathematics and the development of its application. This event strongly supports our mission to prepare students who have excellence, ethical, national skill in the field of computer science especially on data science to produce competitive graduates at the national and international levels. I would like to thank all the students of Diponegoro University of staying home and staying safe amidst the coronavirus outbreaks. I hope that you, your loved one, and all of us are safe and well. I pray that this COVID-19 will pass soon so we can return to our usual activities. Amen. What again, I want to heartily welcome you to this event. It is my pleasure one more time to say thank you and welcome in visiting Professor Evan of Informatics Department. I hope this visiting Professor Evans can inspire many scientists to improve their research and open broader international collaboration between institutions. Last but not least, by grace of God Almighty and consent of all participants, on behalf of Faculty of Science and Mathematics, Diponegoro University, I am as the Dean Herbay. I announce that online visiting Professor Ifun in machine learning and data mining class is open. I encourage all participants to participate actively in the interesting discussion. Hopefully, what I am doing today is useful for our progress in the future. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Thank you, Prof. Widowati, for the welcome speech, uh, which is also the sign that this this event is officially opened. And distinguished guests, fellow colleagues, and students, of course, the next item for today's event will be the lecture which will be delivered by Professor Tom Heskes from Redbone University. And as for the moderator for today's lecture will be Mr. Fajar Agung Nugroho. So without further ado, let us all welcome Mr. Fajar Agung and Professor Tom Heskes. Mr. Fajar Agung, the stage is yours. Thank you, Mr. Ismi. <clears throat> okay, everyone, before we start our first session, let me introduce you to Professor Tom Heskes. He's a professor of artificial intelligence, data science, Institute for Computing and Information Science, Redwood University, Nijmegen. Nijmegen is about two hours by train from Amsterdam. Uh, regarding his career, he started his PhD also at Redwood University at the year of 1989. And long story short, in 2008, he started his full professor also at Redbot University, Nijmegen. His research interests are machine learning, of course, in approximate inference, multitask learning, causal discovery, dynamic based network, and preference learning. Also, to put application to neuroimaging, brain computer interf interfaces. FMRI analysis, and also bioinformatics. He also won several grants, and the most prestigious one is Fiji Grant in the year of 2006, 
And in 2014, he won top grant both from Dutch Research Council. So in this stage, the first session of this lecture will be uh, a bit a review of basic mission learning uh, around 30, 20 minutes and followed by 45 minutes of reinforcement learning. And finally, we will have 15 minutes of Q&A. Although we have a specific uh, session for Q&A, you are free, uh, our students, you are free to raise your hand and give chat to me or to the group. I will read it for you to ask if you want to ask question during the lecture time. I think that's all for the information. Uh, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Tom Heskes. Professor, the stage is yours now. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Fajar, and, and thank you to the others as well for the very nice uh, speech and for, the, and for the very nice welcome. Um, it's really a pity that I cannot be in Indonesia today. Um, <laughs> I, lo I love the country, I've been there before, but because of COVID, well, we cannot really do this kind of live, so that's why we have to do it virtually. Um, so I, I will do my best to be, be as lively as I would normally be if I would be there um, um, in person. Um, I, I should also say that it's good that you're not here in, in, in the Netherlands today. I'm not sure if you, if you can see that the weather is, is really terrible. So um, yeah. this is to, to really visit this. But as you could also see, we have a really nice castle and a really nice campus. Um, so definitely a place to be as, as, um, as Mr. Fajar himself can be also. I yeah, which, I would love to come back there. Okay, the, 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 <laughs> we're looking really forward to that. <laughs> okay, so let's now start the real business. So what I will do is indeed, I will give a very short kind of recap for, for you on, on machine learning, right? So I know that you're already kind of halfway through the course and you, you've learned many, many really good things. So it's not going to be very new what I'm going to say, but maybe with a slightly different touch and, and then you can also get used to, uh, to kind of me a bit uh, because then the second half, it's going to be pretty difficult when we kind of talk about uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, so let me share my screen. Um, I have to pick the right one, and it's this one. Uh, this is not what I want to have. So can you see my screen? Yes, it's... Right? Okay, very good. Okay, so... Um, we're going to talk about machine learning, right? So that's, uh, that's all we need to do for the first 20 minutes. And uh, so if you really want to check later on whether you, you got from, from the meeting what you, what you should get, then, then these are for me the two main points, right? So you should be able to tell the difference between supervised learning and super learning, reinforcement learning. And in the second half, we will, we will talk a lot about reinforcement learning. But that's, I guess the main message for kind of this short part will be to talk about laser and inductive bias, generalization error, those kind of really, really important uh, topics within machine learning. Okay, so quick introduction. So learning, hopefully you agree with me, is a very essential aspect of, of intelligence, right? So we need somehow to kind of learn because otherwise we're gonna make the same mistake all, all over again, right? Then we are this donkey uh, constantly making mistakes. So we don't want to do that. So we need it for flexible behavior to improve ourselves. Um, because we can learn, we need less initial knowledge, right? So it's, it's very important to learn to, Im to improve, but also to learn new things, right? And, um, and we don't want to repeat the stupid behavior. So there are many ways to define machine learning. And I think the first definition is probably in, in, in 59. So it's a field of study that gives computers the, the, the ability to learn without explicitly being programmed. So that was the definition. And actually there was a very nice uh, program that Arthur Samuel, that Arthur Samuel wrote, uh, which, which was to play the game of checkers, which is not a very difficult one, but still uh, uh, very well done, of course. 
So the other one, Matt Mitchell, um, is it, kind of the definition that I like best. And it's a very concrete definition. So he talks about a well-posed learning problem. And a well-posed learning problem is one where you have a computer program that can learn from experience, right? So you need to have some data there or some experience. Um, it depends on the task. So you have to define the task. And then you need to uh, compute the performance, uh, P. And it really learns if the performance on this task, as measured by this, by this performance P, improves if you add more experience, right? And then if you have that, then that's a machine learning system. Well, as you probably know, um, uh, machine learning is used in many, many different areas. And there are different types of machine learning, right? So we have unsupervised learning, supervised learning, reinforcement learning. And then uh, there, there are these different branches that you can see in this very nice image here. So you have recommender systems, you have uh, maybe playing games. Uh, we will get to that in the second part. Um, and, and supervised learning you can do for weather forecasting. So, so many, many different examples of uh, machine learning problems where you can apply different types of machine learning. So machine learning is very popular these days. Um, and, and that sometimes leads to a bit of a, of a discussion, right? So there is the field of, of artificial intelligence and there was, then there was machine learning and then there's also deep learning. And some people have the impression maybe that deep learning is equivalent to artificial intelligence. Well, it's not. Artificial intelligence is much broader and it's also a bit older than, than machine learning, but in particular, it's, it's a lot broader. So there are rule-based systems that don't do any learning at all but are still very useful. There are many applications of artificial intelligence that do not belong to the area of machine learning. So machine learning is really a subset of artificial intelligence when we want to learn models from data, from experience. And then within that class of machine learning, there is deep learning as a specific model for machine learning, right? So don't fall into the trap that deep learning is now a really, really hot topic. I'll say a bit about that also in the second part. Um, but it's not the whole of AI. AI, so artificial intelligence is a lot broader. And then there's also the field of data science. So I myself, I'm um, part of the data science group. And, and I sometimes have to explain what the difference is between artificial intelligence, data science, machine learning. So for me, data science really overlaps a lot with the machine learning part of artificial intelligence. But there are also, Right? Maybe some topics that are not considered to be a part of machine learning, but are still very important if you're studying data science. And then I think about how to maintain databases, how to build databases, maybe also association analysis, right? You, you find it in your data mining books, but you don't really find it in machine learning books. But I mean, it's not crystal clear where the distinction between data mining and machine learning is. And, and so, um, it's, it's not so easy to define it, but maybe data science is a bit bigger in some aspects and definitely smaller in, in others. Okay, so let me zoom in on a couple of applications. So, um, um, and, and these are mainly for deep learning because it's such a hot topic. So deep learning, you, you see a lot on, uh, for, for image analysis, right? So uh, detecting faces in images, attacking images, um, so this, on the right-hand side, you, you see an example of, of AlphaGo, and AlphaGo is a, um, a machine learning system to learn the play of Go. Right? So I will say more about that later. It's also using lots of deep, lots of deep learning. And yeah, it works. So here's another application of, of, of uh, machine learning and deep learning. So this is counting cars. It's, it's done by, by a company that I'm also involved in. Um, so spin-off from a university. And as you can see, it's, it, it's trying to kind of indicate where the cars are. It's a, it's a kind of segmentation problem, but then, but then in the video stream, and it has to go really fast, right? So you have to do this really fast. So that's kind of the challenge there. Um, you also have applications in speech recognition, uh, because speech you can really transform into an image and then you can apply more or less similar techniques. Um, and you can also think about chatbots, right? So part of my group is really into a natural language processing and, and, and working on, on things like, uh, like chatbots. At the end of the day, right, if you think about what machine learning really does, is um, it, it really tries to think about making models out of data, but so in, in such a way that when you 
um, have, for example, if you want to classify a person, that if you have someone who's very similar, then you want to give the same class label, right? So there is some kind of smoothness there. And that's also what, what, what is used in, in, in recommender systems and in collaborative filtering. Um, so you're always looking for kind of similar people there, and then you're kind of projecting what you already know about some of the people that you have in your database to you as a person. And that's why you get all these kind of recommendations. So there, there are a lot of companies using this type of, of machinery. Okay, so that about the, the examples. So now what can you learn from, right? So, and actually you can learn from many, many, many different things, but the, the field of machine learning, we're actually only really learning from kind of data being given examples. We have data sets and then we have lots of examples and we try to learn from that. But you could also learn maybe from analogies or from, uh, from doing things yourself, which is a bit more in reinforcement learning and, um, and also from being taught, right? So, so programming, you could say it's also some kind of learning. But it's not what we're talking about in machine learning. We're mainly talking about being given examples. And then for me, it helps to, to put it into a scheme. And then the scheme looks something like this, right? So there is a learning agent. So particularly when we're going to talk about reinforcement learning, it's very natural to think about an agent operating in some, some environment. So the, the agent gets experiences and data. The agent also has background knowledge and bias. Uh, there were no machine learning algorithms with it without bias. We'll come back to that. Then there is a particular problem that you want to solve. Right? So the, there was this task that was also mentioned in this definition by Thomas Mitchell. And then you want to give an answer or, or you want to somehow compute the performance of the, of the learning agent. So, um, so this is a good way to, 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 to think about the machine learning system. And then typically what we have is that within this machine learning system, there is an internal representation, so it's some kind of model of, of the data or of the environment, and there is some reasoning, so some kind of algorithm that tells you, okay, if this is, if this is now your internal representation, then, then you're given this particular input, then this is going to be your output, or this is going to be your action, right? So there, there, there was a representation, and there was some, some kind of reasoning going on in these machine learning systems. Okay, this is probably well known, but let me do a quick recap there. So um, if you have a machine learning system, then you can get different types of feedback, right? Supervised, reinforcement learning, unsupervised. So just a very, some, 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 some nice pictures maybe. Um, so for supervised learning, right, if your task is to classify animals, and here you see a spider, but actually um, the model says it's a lizard, then you're going to get the information that it's not a lizard, no, it's actually a spider. So that is what we would call supervised learning because there is kind of a teacher telling you the right answer, right? And you can use that information. So you get quite a lot of information. There. In reinforcement learning, um, if there are many, many different options or many different actions that you can do, there is no teacher telling you what the right action is. At best, he or she is going to tell you what's right or what's wrong, right? Whether you, you did a good action and in some cases, you only learn this, well, actually in many cases, when we're talking about reinforcement learning, at a very late, late time, right? So think about playing a game. Um, you're, you're making all these kind of moves, but no one is gonna tell you during the game whether that's a good move or whether it's a bad move. Only at the end of the game, you get basically one bit, whether you won or whether you lost, right? So that's a typical example of reinforcement learning. And based on this single bit, you have to try and learn um, why you made a mistake or why you made this kind of beautiful move that, that, um, that, that made that you won the game, right? So, uh, so that's reinforcement learning. So no information about what the good steps are or what the good answers are, uh, but only kind of one bit saying whether it's good or, or bad. And then often at a very late stage. And then it can be even worse. So you can have unsupervised learning, you get no information at all. You could think, wow, well, how can I learn anything well, a bit similar to what I, what, I did, what I discussed before, because objects, uh, some objects are more similar than other, to, to, to each other than to other objects, right? And then if, if you think about that, you can try and group, for example, objects. So you can group, for example, animals, and animals that are close to each other belong to the same group, and animals that are, that are very different from each other, they will end up in different groups. 
right? So that's what we call unsupervised learning and the prototypical example of that is clustering. And you can do that for animals they, uh, based on features that they have. You can do that for images. You can do that for text. You can do this for kind of many different types of data. Okay, maybe a bit more about supervised learning. Um, so supervised learning, you, you can again kind of subdivide into two different uh, types of tasks, classification regression, and it will say a bit about um, generalization, overfitting, and Occam's razor. So in supervised learning, you are given a, a set of training examples, right? And you know that because you've seen already quite some uh, supervised learning algorithms. So you have inputs and you have outputs, okay? Now, one way to think about that is that essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to induce a model. So in almost all machine learning models, uh, machine learning algorithms, there is some kind of model. So think about the decision tree or about the support vector machine or a neural network or what. So, so there is all, always some kind of internal representation there. And what we need to do is we, have, we try to induce these models. We call that induction. So for, we're given e examples. And then we try to, to come up with some model that kind of explains these, these examples, right? So that's called induction. And then using this model, we can do deduction. So deduction means that I have a model, I maybe have a new input, and then I can deduce what the output should be for that particular input, okay? So that's how you can make, using a model, you can make predictions on unseen inputs. So that's what we're trying to do with, with most of the machine learning. And if we want to do induction, then there is a fundamental problem. We want to find our hypothesis, not just, just explaining all the data that we have, but really to make good predictions on unseen data, on data that we have not seen before, right? So, um, so we want to find a, a hypothesis that tells us something about this data that we've seen that and we, we say then that generalizes well, right? It, ha it needs to be performed well on examples never seen before. We don't want to just memorize the training sets, completely useless. Um, because if you want to do that, then just store your data set and you're done. Right? So if you think about that, well, you could ask yourself the question, I don't know see, see actually, but I have a tree behind me here. Well, somewhat of a tree is actually planted. It's a pretty big one. Um, so the question that you can ask is, is this particular, uh, oh, it's, a, it's a plant, it's maybe not a tree, but would you call this a tree? Or is this object that we have on the side, would you call that a tree? And then, well, depending on, on where you're from, maybe, um, you can say, well, yes, it's a, it's a tree because it's green. Right? Oh, it's a bit more about trees than just being green, but anyway, so uh, this guy then says, well, no, um, I've never seen a tree with exactly, so how many leaves are there? I don't know, and a bit strange shape. So no, I would not call this a tree. Okay. So the truth is somewhere in between probably, right? So because this valley well, we would probably not gonna call a tree, right? So this is too simple, but, but the, the, the first person says, well, it's still a, still a tree because it's green. And the, and the other one says, no, it's not because uh, I've never seen a tree like this before. So it's not always very crystal clear what the correct answer is, right? And, and some people make a model which is maybe too too simple, everything needs to be green, and other people maybe make a model which is too complicated. So it has to be, a, it's only a tree if it has this exact number of, of, of leaves. So both are kind of not really good models in practice, right? So how do we pick kind of the right models? Well, every model has a, a particular bias, right? So it has a preference for some type of data. So when, when I think about the, the deep, learning models that are really popular these days, right? So these deep, deep neural networks, they work really well on images because they have these convolutional layers, so specific type of kind of uh, structures that you put into these, these neural networks. And that works really well for images, but it's completely useless if you, if you apply it to completely different type of data and maybe just text without doing any pre-processing, right? It's not gonna work at all. So, the model is biased to a particular type of data and it will work on a particular type of data really well and maybe not so good on a lot of other data. And then I can try and make different models right, and, and apply them both to, to data and then maybe both explain the data pretty well, but one is very complicated and the other one is relatively simple. Which one should we pick? And then there is this great um, 
a framework called uh, Occam's Razor. And Occam's Razor tells us that we should go for the simple model because very likely the simple model will generalize to new data that we have not seen before much better than the very complicated model with many, many different parameters. So that's a very good uh, strategy to, um, to uphold to, to, to make sure that, that when you have different models, both explaining the, the, the training data, pick the simplest one, because it's probably gonna uh, generalize better. And we've seen it in many cases before, right? So humans, we as humans, we, we were using Occam's razor all the time, even though we don't have really re realize that. So if I ask you to give me the next number in line two, four, six, eight, you'll probably say 10. Or at least I hope you're gonna say 10. Although it's very easy to come up with um, a, a formula that, that has a two, four, six, eight, um, 11.14, right? Not so difficult, just take a fifth order polynomial and it will fit through these uh, five points. Um, but it's not kind of a simple model, right? It's a much more complicated model than saying we're just gonna add two every time, okay? And uh, so this is a famous example in, in human history, right? So there were these two different models at some point in time of, of how the planets, um, about the movement of the plan planets. There was one model by Ptolemaeus, and he had a very complicated model, which was very ingenious, but with lots of circles and blah, blah, and going around each other and so on. And the, the Earth was, a, was in the center of the universe, and then he could explain perfectly all, all the movements of, of the planets, but he needed a very complicated model, many parameters. And then Kepler came and he said, well, maybe the sun is in the center, and then I just need one simple rule, um, and then I can describe the, the, the ellipses, which are the movements of these planets, um, in, in quite some detail, um, and it's very accurate, but it's a very simple model. I guess most people now believe that Kepler is um, uh, description is better than, than Ptolemaeus, and when we discover new planets, then Kepler's um, uh, formula still worked, whereas Ptolemaeus had to come up with a new model. Um, so I, I don't care so much, but I think that simpler models in, in history of, of human life appear to work in general much better than the more complicated. Okay, so um, well, you can play this game yourself. So let's take just like three minutes to, to go through this. And um, um, yeah, so this is a bit more complicated to do, uh, to do virtually, uh, but, but think with me for just maybe one or two minutes on, on these four examples. So what you have to do here is you have to tell which one does not belong to the set of four, right? So you see here four different options, A, B, C, D and one of them does not belong there. And what you have to try and do is to make a model, hopefully a simple model, that explains why three belong to that model and one does not, okay? So three should belong to this model and one does not belong to this model. So which one is kind of the weird one here? Which is the odd one? So when I did before, I think many students went for C because it's kind of lower than the other ones, right? Um, this is, well, yeah, it's a model. You can use that model. Um, it's not a particular elegant model. And so, um, yeah, it's hard to ask, right? So, but I hope some of you at least went for answer B here. And why would it be B? Well, if you, if you look carefully, then it's all, all about letters, right? Um, uh, uh, numbers, sorry. It's all about numbers. And oh, B yeah. the one where the first number is kind of written normally and the second one is opposite. In all the other cases, it's, it's the other one, right? So the, the six, the first one is opposite and the second one is uh, the, the normal six. Um, so this is one model, right, that you can have and, and it explains why seven is the weird one and, and the others are the right one's there. Well, this one, maybe, think about it, which is, um, B. So see which one is the odd one out here. So think, try and come up with a model that explains why one of them does not belong to this set of um, four images, four pictures, and then uh, let me know. Is it B? You Ben? Uh, I'm not sure if you can see this. So this is one, it's two, 
This is maybe four. Uh, and now, ah, now I probably have to go like this, right? So I guess three are right hand and one is left hand. And so that is a simple model, right? Three right hand, I think the first one is right hand, second one is right hand, fourth one is right hand, but I think the third one is left hand. So try, try, no, simple model that can explain the difference between these different images. Um, well, maybe I'm gonna skip this one, try it yourself. It may also be nice to see, here we have five options. One, there was one odd one here. So which is the odd one here? So we're having flow, snip, trap, draw, and back. It's um, also an, an, an exercise in English language. So, uh, so that helps maybe a bit. So the weird one, let me give you the answer. Uh, so the weird one is the last one because all the other ones, I can turn them around and it's still an English word. Right? So flow and wolf and snip and pins and trap and port and draw and ward. But back, I have no idea what that is if I turn it around. Right? So again, a simple model. Can you turn it around and it's still an English word? Then uh, it belongs to kind of the, the, the category and otherwise it does not. So that's what we try to do. And in this case, in these cases, it's not so simple because you have to kind of a bit step out of the the examples, right? So you're seeing letters, but you have to think about the meaning of them and, and so on. So it's a bit more complicated, but um, it's, it's fun to, to try and do this. Okay, so supervised learning. So let me continue. So uh, we have input features, output targets, uh, we have training examples, and then we want to predict for a new example, right? And uh, th there is a distinction between regression and classification. In regression, we have a continuous output, so examples are predicting the temperature for tomorrow, uh, maybe stock values and classification. And then the outputs are discrete, whether it's gonna rain tomorrow, yes or no. Well, in the Netherlands, definitely it's gonna rain tomorrow. Um, and, and maybe uh, uh, other examples could be whether you can classify an image and whether it belongs to um, uh, maybe one type of animal or another type of animal. Okay, so for regression, um, if, if you go to kind of the simplest example, you have one dimensional input and one dimensional output, right? And then it, it, it really looks like curve fitting. So you try to construct a curve that agrees with, um, with the training data that you have. A more complicated example would be the Boston housing set. So this is a famous data set where you have for, for many different houses in the area of Boston, uh, you, you, you want to predict the the price of the house based on the number of rooms. So that's one particular feature, the size, the neighborhood, um, well, all kinds of features. And then you can make plots of that. And, and it's, it's a very nice data set to kind of try and, and, and apply um, a different machine learning algorithm. So the problem with, with many algorithms is that you can make them rather complicated or you can keep them very simple. So here's just an example. So here you, you can make a linear fit through the data, which is relatively simple. You, you can add another parameter and say, well, I want to have a parabolic curve, right? So, and I have a to the x squared as another term in, in my equation. I can, I can go to a third or order polynomial and I can also go to a very, very complicated function that goes extract exactly through all the data points but probably it won't do very well on new unseen data. Right? So uh, the question that you always have to ask yourself, how complicated can my model be, right? And linear here is maybe the simplest model, but not such a good fit. And a, a cubic maybe a zero error, but it really appears to overfit. And the last one that, that we saw definitely is overfitting a lot, right? So you don't want to underfit, fit. So your model should not be too simple. It should also not be too complicated. Okay, so overfitting for regression is kind of obvious, but you have the same thing with classification. You can also overfit there and really zoom in on, on particular outliers. For classification, we, we're typically having, uh, um, uh, well, with binary classification, only two possible answers is output, so true or false, or plus one, minus one. Um, but there are also classification problems with many, many, many different classes. Okay. Um, 
at the end of the day, you want to evaluate the performance of your model, right? And there are many different ways of doing that. Um, so, but, but all the time, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see whether the prediction of my model agrees with, with what I have on my data set, in, in, in my data set, right? For supervised learning problems. So we're making a prediction and we want to check whether it's close to what according to the data the prediction should be. Right? And then you can, you, you can measure that with so-called error measures. There are many different ones. Um, so here I have two obvious ones, one for regression, the other one more for, for classification. Uh, so one is sum of squared errors. So the prediction, this y hat, I compare it to what I have in my data set, the y, and then I square that, and then I sum that over all the data points that I have, right? So that would be uh, the sum of squared errors. And I can also do something like entropy for classification. Then I interpret the output of my model as a probability. And, and then I'm gonna compare this probability basically with, with the number, uh, with the class label that I have in my data set. And then it should be represented as a zero and a one. Right? Do that, then um, entropy is a good measure. Now the, the important point that I wanna make, it doesn't matter which error measure you're gonna use, but you have to report the performance of your machine learning model on a test set, on an independent set that you did not use for training. And also did not use for even choosing the model if you, if you do it completely correctly, right? So, and that's why we invented these, these methods like, like cross-validation. So what you do there is you have your whole data set, you, you break it into pieces. So maybe you break it into 10 pieces, then you train on nine of these pieces and you test. So you evaluate the performance on the tenth one, right? So on, on the, the piece that you didn't, the part of the training of, of, of the data set that you didn't use for training your model. So we call that the test set. But if you can do it once, you can also do it 10 times, right? So then you, you leave out another uh, part of your data set, you train on the, on the, on the nine parts that you, that you now are gonna use for training, and then you predict on this unseen data. So if you do that 10 times, and you're making very effective use of your data, um, and then you have to report that particular error, right? So the test error is really what we care about and not the training error. I, to be completely honest, I don't care at all because it's very easy to make very complicated models that do perfectly on the training data, but give lousy performance on test data. And then I don't care because that's not the goal of machine learning. Okay, so that was the first part. So those were the things that I want to talk about in the first part before we're going to go to the reinforcement learning. And uh, Mr. Fatcher, so um, you already gave them the questions, right? Yes, we, we gave to our students. And sadly, most students failed on question number four and nine. Ah, okay, so let's, then let's see. So, may, so maybe I'm, but I don't know. Now let's see what, what we can do now. Um, yes. So that I post, right? Um, okay, so the first one you got, right? So artificial intelligence and machine learning are not the same. So AI has many, many different topics. Um, and some of them really are about machine learning, but not all of them, okay? Spam filter, supervised learning. Uh, document clustering, yes. Um, a typical example of unsupervised learning. Number four, uh, machine learning models make no assumptions about the problems that they try to solve. Yeah, so this is a good one. So I'm, I'm very happy that I put that in. So we, we tend to give this, this impression, right? That machine learning models are, are so flexible, they can do anything. Well, not true. Um, um, there is always some kind of bias in there. So convolutional neural networks, very good at images, completely useless for the Boston housing data set. It's not gonna work at all, right? So, and um, on the Boston housing data, um, and a, a simple neural, neural network, feed forward, forward neural network might, might work. Support vector machine might work. Um, a decision tree is probably not so good, right? So some models work better on some types of data and other models work better on other types of data. And it's because all of these models have some implicit bias. There is no way around that. And even though it's not explicit, it's definitely implicit in these models. So um, just as an example, in decision trees, as you probably know, we're always making kind of cuts, right? So we're making splits based on data. So these models are really good if your, your, uh, you, you, you can classify your data based on just looking at a few features. If you need all the features for that, 
family decision trees are not going to work so well. They're not meant to, to be for this type of data. And some, somewhat similar for feed forward neural networks. So they're really good at kind of interpolating, in, in, interpolating relatively smooth functions because they, they have these sigmoid functions in there of maybe, or maybe rectified linear units, which are more uh, popular these days. Uh, but it has to be somewhat smooth and then they're doing pretty much okay. Right? So there are always implicit assumptions in uh, machine learning models. And that's why we have to sometimes just try them out, right? And, and see which one works work, work best. Okay, so that, that, that was four. Uh, five, yeah, Occam's razor. Um, so most of you got that right then. And uh, let me see. Uh, six, stock prices, regression problem, overfitting um, is, is definitely also an issue for classification problems, right? I, I can show you examples, but if you got that right, I don't have to. Segmentation of metal images, yeah, you can phrase it as a classification problem, um, and that's what people do a lot these days. Um, so we have a very strong group here at the Rabat UMC working on, on medical image recognition. And, and so what they do is that, that they have segmentations and then, and then, then they say maybe trying to uh, sort out uh, wh where, where the tumor is or maybe a particular brain area or whatever. So someone kind of made a very nice drawing showing where this particular object is. And then everything that kind of needs to be uh, segmented out has label one and the rest has label zero. And then you can use that to basically classify pixel by pixel, whether it's part of the segmentation, yes or no. Okay, so uh, you can turn it into classification. Yeah, so, uh, oh, this should be nine, I guess, right? So this is my, my typo. Let me see. Yeah, so this should be nine. It's my fault. I, I did the wrong numbering here. Okay, yeah, so right. okay, yeah. So the, the the formulation is a bit tricky, but I have to shoot there. So to evaluate the performance of a supervised machine learning algorithm, we should consider both the error it makes on the training data and on the test data. And like I said, I don't get. Oh, I know. I should be careful what I'm saying. I don't care at all about the performance on your training data. I don't care. So give me the performance on your test data, and that's what I care about. The, the performance on your training data, it's so easy to make it, to make it uh, going to zero or maybe to, to a very small number. It doesn't matter. You should look at the performance on your test data. And I'm emphasizing this because it's so easy to uh, fall in the trap of saying, well, my model is really good on my training data. Don't care. It doesn't matter. The only thing that, that cares is whether your model predicts new data well. Right? And the only way you can test that is by leaving data out and then fitting your whatever complicated model and reporting the performance on your test data. Don't care about the training data. So you definitely should not do that. Um, well, so you don't need to do that, I should say. Uh, if you want to report it, maybe tell your mom, uh, but, but not in any scientific kind of report or anything like that. You don't care. Okay. Um, okay. Before we continue to a second session, can we can I use this moment to congratulate our top three students who scored the highest in the quiz from the first quiz? Is it okay, Professor? Definitely. Then I can yeah. take a yeah. yeah, you can have a three. Uh, congratulations to our top three. The third place is for Achi Satrio Nugroho with a score of 88. He finished this within three minutes only. And the second place is Fiona Muliono. Wow, she got 100 for this, but for 13 minutes. And the first place is for Carolina Salsapila. She also saw a score for 100 within seven minutes. Congratulations for those three students. Uh, you will earn something from our department, Mr. Adivo. Hopefully. <laughs> oh, that's all, uh, Professor Tom. We can get yeah, to a second session. I, I, I gave you one slide with some of the answers, but, but you didn't see that, right? Um, let me go to the next one. Um, there we are.
Okay, are you still awake? Because then we can continue with the second part about reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning, I don't think you had anything in the course, right? So I probably have to go a bit slower here. Um, and if you have any questions in between, then put them in the chat and, and watch our, so do wake me up and, and maybe just stop me um, uh, to, to maybe spend a bit more time if, if I'm going too, too fast on, on some of the slides. So we still have quite some time. So, um, so let's see, okay? So these are what, what I would say are the learning goals here. So you have to be able to tell what, what is different comparing reinforcement learning to supervised learning. The main elements are really important, uh, state, action, reward. And so at the end of the day, what reinforcement learning tries to do is to understand Bellman's equation. Sorry, to, to approximate the solution of Bellman's equation. So I have to explain Bellman's equation. There's no way around that. Um, and we, all, we will also talk about Q-learning. And then it's good because it's a very popular topic these days. Deep Q learning is what people, about what the people from, um, from DeepMind use to, uh, to solve uh, uh, the game of Go and, and for Atari games and things like that. Um, so to understand at least the, the kind of main principles behind it, right? So that's what you should get from, from, from this lecture. Okay, so we have been talking about supervised learning. We said a bit about unsupervised learning. And now we're gonna talk about reinforcement learning. Right. In a sense, you can consider this to be a bit more general even than, than supervised learning, unsupervised learning. So it's kind of a more active procedure, right? So you're, you're walking around somehow and you get feedback and you try to learn based on that. So that's kind of the, the mood that you should be in. So you really learn from interaction with the environment to achieve a particular goal, okay? So uh, you, you are this agent, right? So we had this learning agent. You can take an action, but the action that you're making has an effect on the environment. So uh, maybe it's a good action and you get a positive reward at some point in time, or you can get a negative reward, but, but it also, the action also changes your state, right? So um, yeah, so, so that's basically uh, what, what, the, what the, the main concept here is. Okay, so I'll give you some examples. We're gonna carefully define what a re reinforcement learning problem is, and we will do that based on so-called Markov decision process. And then we're gonna, we're gonna give a hint at how you can solve reinforcement learning problems. And there are many, 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 many different algorithms for that. So I will quickly uh, try to explain Q-learning. Okay, so here, here's one problem, and, and this is kind of the prototypical example of reinforcement learning. So you have a robot and it's in a room. So this is a very simple world, it, it has only um, uh, four times three is 12 squares and, and one is and you, you cannot even reach so that so there are basically 11 squares that you can go to um, and there were two rewards so if you end up at the top right square then you get a reward of plus one if you end up just one square below that you get a reward of minus one okay so you're gonna you can move around right and so what you can do is you can go up, you can go down, you can go left, you can go right. Uh, but here I've shown for up what the result is gonna be uh, because it's not gonna be deterministic here in this case. So if you wanna go up, right? So maybe you drank a bit too much or I don't know what happened, but 80% sure you're gonna, you're gonna go up, but maybe 10% you're gonna go left or 10% you're gonna go right, right? So you're not really sure what the result of your action is going to be, uh, but you're very sure that, well, you don't maybe know that yet, but if you end up at the, at the top right corner, so um, let me indicate that. So, oh, it doesn't work because I didn't use my pencil. Let's see. Use my pencil here. So if you end up here, you get a reward of plus one if you end up here you get a reward of minus one. So this is not what you wanna have. So this is pretty bad. So you don't wanna have this, but you definitely wanna have this, right? So this you could say is a golden problem. Okay. Um, there's also in this case, so negative reward is basically penalty, right? So we will, we will see different solutions later on for different penalties for each step that you're gonna make, right? So you can have um, the a penalty of 0 0.04. So that means that 25 steps basically are as expensive 
as the reward that you're gonna get. So if you don't, uh, if you don't manage to to reach the goal in 25 steps, then maybe it's pretty useless what you're doing, right? So that's the way that you should interpret this. Okay, so if this is your task, right? So you have this robot in in the room, then what's the solution of that, right? So how do you solve this problem? Right? So you want to kind of reach this this target. You want to get this reward, right? And so what should you do? Right? So that's the problem that we have, that we have. Well, you could say, well, um, well, it's easy, right? So I'm going to start here. So we're, we were starting at the, at, the, at the left bottom corner. So we were basically starting here. And well, all I need to do is I go, I go up and then I go to the right and then I reach my target. Well, life is not so simple because we said that it's stochastic, right? So that, that's one problem that we have. So if, I, if I'm going up, well, it's not for sure that I'm really going up, right? So if I have the intention to take that action, I might not end up uh, in this state, I might also end up here. So uh, that, that's one thing that's not going to work. And the other thing that doesn't really work is, well, if I'm going to end up here, you didn't tell me what I should do here. So I don't know. Right? So this is not this, the whole solution. It cannot be because I, I might end up even here and you didn't tell me what to do there. So this is not the whole solution to, to the problem. So we should be more clever than that. Right, so the actions are stochastic, so we have to keep that in mind. So that's the most reinforcement learning problems. And we need to have what we then call a policy. And a policy is a mapping from each possible state that you can be in. And here a state corresponds to a location in this particular room. Um, so you need this mapping from every state to a particular action, okay? So you also have to tell me what you're gonna do if you're in here. So that's what we call a policy a mapping from a state to an action. Okay, so here is the optimal policy. If there is no reward nor penalty, you could say a reward of zero for taking steps. So it doesn't matter. So you can walk around as long as you like, it, it, it doesn't play any role. Okay, and then um, what I'm showing here is the action, the intention that, that, that you have to take when you're in a particular state. Right, so a state corresponds to, to, to one of these locations. And then if you're in this, in this particular state, then the best action to take according is to go to the left. It might happen that you then go, or, yeah, it might happen that you then go up, or maybe that you go down, which means that you're gonna stay. Uh, but that's, that can happen because it's a stochastic um, transition that you're making, right? So you're not sure what the, what the outcome of your action is going to be. Uh, but then you can argue and you can compute that. And in this case, not so difficult, in fact, to compute it. So you don't need any reinforcement learning for that. But you can compute that this, is, this would be the optimal policy. So the policy that kind of works best. The issue, um, we, we then say the highest uh, total amount of reward. I will specify that in more detail later on. Okay? So, but hopefully you can imagine that when you have a different penalty um, or reward for each step, then the solution is going to be different. Right? So if I have a reward minus two for every step that I'm going to make, so I, I penalize it very heavily, then, um, well, even if, you, if you're going to end up at, at kind of the bad solution here, minus one, better do this as quickly as possible because if you're going to take another step, it's, it's going to cost you. Right? So even if you're here, um, in, this, in this particular location, if you're here, you directly want to go there because then you're done, right? So then you have minus three as a penalty, minus two for a step, and minus one for the reward that you're going to get. But it's better than just walking around in another direction because it's going to pay you more and more. It's going to cost you more and more. So uh, this is kind of strange reward. Um, you're, yeah, you get a completely different policy. So you should go as quickly as possible to one of the, we call, we call these two the terminal states. Okay, so let me give me, uh, give you two more examples. So here there is a, a, a small penalty uh, for, for taking steps and then you get slightly different behavior, um, quite different from what we just had. Um, and, and then this is maybe the most natural 
uh, one. So this is why we have a tiny penalty for taking steps. So it's not too bad to, to walk around. So then the, the most important thing to note here is that, that when you're here, right, you rather take this route than, than taking this one, because here you might go wrong, right? So here, if you're here, then there, there is a 10% chance that you're actually ending up over there, right? Because of this stochastic state transition. Okay, um, and this is the, the kind of weird case. If, if it's good to walk around, actually it's pretty good to walk around, but um, so if you really pay for that, then, then you're walking away basically from, from the terminal states, right? So even if you're here, well, don't go there, uh, just make a few more moves because uh, walking around is good. So try to walk around as much as you can. And so depending on, on the reward that you're gonna get, you get completely, you can get completely different policy. Okay, so this is a simple example of a robot in a room, uh, but of course there, there are more, um, more challenging examples. And so one uh, pretty famous example is pole balancing, right? So um, you, you have a pole on the, on the car and you have to, to move the car such that the pole stays straight, right? So that it doesn't fall down. So it's a complicated problem. It's very related in a sense to, to a control problem. And um, so that's also what, what's on this slide here. So it's a bit similar in some cases to control theory, um, uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, but in other cases, I mean, it doesn't really look like that. Another example, and I, I will say a bit more about that, is AlphaGo and AlphaZero. So you may have heard about that, right? So, so it's a reinforcement learning for playing the game of Go, uh, which is very complicated uh, a, a game. So it, it's really amazing that they, um, that they managed to kind of they solve this, right, and, and be better than the, than the best human player. Um, and, and another one could be um, automatic flying of helicopters, right? So that you can also see that as a reinforcement learning problem. Okay, so what's important to keep in mind is that there is no teacher here, right? So no one is gonna tell you what the good and the bad, bad actions are. You only get a reward, you could say, at the end, right? So the, the, the reward is delayed. Uh, if, you, if you make steps, maybe you get some reward in between, but the main reward, right, at the terminal state, you will get at the end. Right? So, um, and it can be very, very late. So think about playing the game of Go. You're making all these different moves, but only at the end of the game, you know whether you won or lost. Right? So, um, and it's just one bit of information that you get for all these different moves that you made and that your opponent made. So what you have to do in a very clever way is you have to explore the environment and learn from the experience that you get, right? So if you think of, again about playing games, you don't wanna make always the same moves because then you're not gonna learn anything, right? So you're, not, you're, you're always gonna play more or less the same game if you have a deterministic opponent. So you have to kind of play around a bit, right? So to get some more experience and to learn what are kind of the good actions and what are the bad actions. Right, so not just, and on the other hand, you also don't want to kind of blindly search because it's also not going to work because then you are, you're spending a lot of time on really, really, really bad solutions, right? And that takes far too long. So you somehow have to be kind of clever about that, how you're going you're gonna to search. Um, okay, so here's this example of reinforcement learning to play Go. So, so what you have to... Realize here is, is that now a state, right, in this case, is a board position. So it's the combination of where the white and the black pieces are on the board. Okay, and, and well, there can be two pieces on the board, there can be four piece, pieces on the board, there, there can be any number of pieces on the board, and it can be at many, many different locations. So the number of states is enormous. Right? So then, and that makes it such a complicated game. Right, so the number of board positions, the number of states that you can have, it's, I, I, I don't even know how to compute that. Well, I probably would, but well, you can imagine many, 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 lots of different board positions. And the reward that you're gonna get, like I said, is only at the end of the game, right? So you've got reward zero for most of the moves that you're gonna make, um, but only at the end of the game when your opponent said, okay, you won, uh, then you got your real reward, which is one, and if you, well, if you had to say, well, I have to give up, then um, if, if you've lost, then the reward is minus one. 
Well, it's, it's a very complicated problem because where did you make the wrong move, right? So you don't know. And the actions are really putting an, a new stone on the, on the board, right? So, and then there are many different actions that you can take because there are all these different positions where you can put your new stone. The number of actions is maybe relatively small compared to the number of states. Your state is really a board position with all the, all the, um, all the stones on the board and, and all the different positions that they can have. And the actions are only the locations where you can still put the, the stone. Okay. So how can we formally describe this? We do that, this with so-called Markov decision processes, MDPs, okay? So in MDPs, we have a set of states. Um, so the, the, the location of the robot in the room or the board position in the game of Go. We have a set of actions. So whether we want to go up or whether we want to go right, left, or down. So in that case, there are only four actions. And in the case of the game of Go, it's where you want to put the next stone on the board. And you start from an initial state, right? So with the robot in the room, we started from the left-hand corner. And with the game of Go, we start with a board position where there are no stones at all, right? So completely empty. Okay, then we have a transition model. So this is very important. So the transition model tells us um, if I'm gonna make and if I'm gonna take an action, where do I end up, okay? So I am in a particular state. So for example, my state was one, one. Right, so that corresponds if I have the board to position. So this is going to be one, one. And now I want to go, um, I'm, I'm going to take the action up and I'm going to end up here. We call this one, one, two. We're going to end up there with probability 0 0.8. So I have to find that, right? So the, and with probability 0, 0 0.2, I'm going to end up here. And with probability 0 0.2, I'm basically going to stay, sorry, with probability 0 0.1. I'm going to end up here. And with probability 0 0.1, I'm going to stay here because I cannot really move there. So then I'm just going to stay. Okay. So, um, and, and all this information has to be in this transition model. Right. So the transition model that tells me if I am in a state, maybe 1.1, if I'm go, going to make the action up, then I'm ending up at, at S prime. So the new state, and maybe 1, 1, 2. Uh, with a particular probability, right, zero, 0 0.8. So this is a stochastic transition model. We're not sure where we're going to end up, okay? Then we have a reward function, and in this case, we had the reward, for example, that if we ended up in, in the, in the right-hand corner, so 4, 3, so if we're going to end up there, then we're going to get a reward of plus 1, okay? So that's a reward. So we have a state, we have an action, and we have a reward to go from uh, a state and an action to the next one, we call that the transition model, and the, the reward is a function typically only of the state, but it can also be in some cases an, an, a function of the state and the action. So it's not so difficult to generalize that. Okay, now what's the goal? The goal is that at the end of the day, we're gonna kind of add the rewards that we're gonna get, right? So we're gonna play, play many games, or we're gonna walk around and we get a reward for every step we're going to make. We're going to play this kind of robot in a room kind of game. We're going to play it many times, right? And then we're going to add up the rewards that we're going to get, okay? So that's, and, and that one we want to maximize, right? So we want to take the actions that maximize the reward that we're going to get in the future. So now the important concept of this policy, right, that we've seen before. So a policy is a mapping from state to actions. Right? So if I'm in this state, what action am I going to take? And there we can, uh, can make a distinction between a deterministic policy. So a deterministic policy says, every time I'm in this state, I'm going to take this action and no other action. Or a stochastic policy. And a stochastic policy uh, says, if I'm in this state, then I'm going to take this action with probability, blah, blah, blah. So don't be confused now. So, so I'm not talking about the stock, this stochasticity in a transition model, which can be stochastic because I'm taking a particular action, but I don't know what the result is going to be. I know I can also decide upon kind of throwing a dice before I'm going to take the action, right? So I can say, well, if I'm here in 1.1, in that's not what we did in, in the examples, but if I'm in 1.1, I can, right? I can, with probability 0 0.9, I'm going up, 
with probability 0 0.05, I'm going to the right, and with probability 0 0.05, I'm going to the left. Right? Well, that doesn't make any sense because I see you don't want to move there. Um, but something like that, right? So that the, the action that you're going to take is also, um, well, before you're going to take the action, you're first going to throw a dice, right? A die. So you're going to throw a die before you're going to take the action. So that's going to be a stochastic policy. policy. And actually, in practice, it's really useful to have a stochastic policy, particularly in the, in the beginning, right, when you don't know so much. Because if you're going to go for a deterministic policy, you're always going to do the same thing. And it might be tricky uh, because you're not going to learn. You're not going to explore a new area, right? You're not going to explore a lot. So stochastic policy really helps to explore kind of different um, possible solutions. Okay. Um, yeah, so what are the challenges now? Right, so what makes reinforcement learning so much more challenging than uh, supervised learning? Well, a couple of things. The transitions and rewards are usually not known, right? So we have to walk around and then at some point we're going to get a reward, but maybe in advance we didn't really know where we could find that, right? When we're playing a game, we don't know when, when we're going to end up in a very good state. Um, so you have to experience and then, and then try to estimate things because you get, of course, when you're playing lots and lots of games, you get lots and lots of information um, because every time you're getting these bits of that was a good game, that was a bad game, and so on. Right? If you play a lot, then you get information. Um, then you get this information, so you get this experience, but how do you then have to change your policy? Right? So how can you make sure that the next time you're playing the same game, you're doing a better job? Right? So how do you change the policy to get better? Um, so you get, there are different techniques for that. Um, so you can either first learn what they call a value function, we'll get to that, or you can also try to, to directly learn the policy. We call it policy-based reinforcement. But, and then there, there's the issue that I already mentioned, is how do you explore the environment, right? So we call that the exploration exploitation trade-off. So if you always follow what for you at that point in time seems to be the best policy, Right? If you're very, very conservative and always going to say, well, this is for me now the best move, then, and I'm always going to make that move, then you're not going to explore a lot. Right? And you're always kind of staying inside, you could say, and always following the same strategy. This is not good in, in the long run because you have to explore the environment a bit and, uh, and then maybe see that there are other opportunities out there right, that, you can, that you can go for. And often this is implemented by adding some kind of randomness to your moves. So that's why we also have these stochastic policies there. Okay. Um, yeah, so how do we compute basically this cumulative reward, right? So I said, well, what we want to do is we want to optimize the, the total reward that we're gonna get. Well, it depends a bit on, the, on the, the type of task. So we distinguish between two different types. So Episodic tasks is when um, there, were, there were terminal states there, right? So in a game, at some point it's over and you're done, right? and you know that you're done. So that's called an episodic uh, uh, task. You can also have a continuing task. So it goes on and on and on, right? And you get rewards along the way. Uh, but if you got a reward, you're not done, you can still continue. So think about kind of a personal assistant robot or just, well, your whole life actually is just kind of, a continuing reinforcement learning game. You could say. The, we, we'd like to do this additive rewards, right? And it's perfectly fine for the episodic games to some extent, um, but not for the, uh, for the continuing task, right? Because then, then you're gonna add these rewards and they get, well, you, you're gonna get infinite at some point. Maybe. So it's not gonna work. So that why they invented so-called discounted rewards. And that's that rewards that you got in the past Right, are discounted. So what you just received is very important, but then later ones are discounted. So they get less and less important. And then you, you need to have a factor for that. And well, the, this factor is called the discount factor. Um, um, so this one is gamma here. And it's, it's typically like 0 0.9 or 0 0.95 or something. Okay. I'm a bit running out of time. So maybe I have to go a bit faster. 
um, value functions, right? So we have to compute somehow, if I am in a particular stain, how good is that stain, right? So is this a good board position? Or, um, and if you think about the robot in the room, so is position 1.3 maybe better than 1.1 because I'm closer to the target, right? So we try to keep track of those. So that, that's called the value function, but it depends also on the policy, right? So it depends on the policy. So if, if I'm in state 1.3 and my policy says go, go down, go down, go down, then it's pretty useless, right? But if it says go to the right, to the right, to the right, then it's pretty good. And so the state value function is a combination of, well, it, it tells you how good the state is given a particular policy. And then we also have an, something that it's a bit similar, but it also includes the action. So what's the quality of take when I'm in a particular state, if I take a particular action given that my policy is such and such. And the policy then tells me what I'm gonna do afterwards. Okay, if I know these, then it's relatively simple to find the optimal policy. In particular, um, um, and if I know this Q of S and A, then I'm just gonna take always the best move, right? So that's not so difficult. And well, to kind of link the state value functions and in different locations, we have a very famous equation. It's called the Bellman equation. I'm not gonna derive it here, but some say that if you study art, if you study art, artificial intelligence, there are a few very important equations. One is Bayes' rule, and another one is definitely Bellman's equation, because it's so important in reinforcement learning, but also for optimization in general, right? And it links, basically, the, the value function at a particular state to value functions at another state as prime. And it, it's kind of backward reasoning that you have to apply here, right? So you can get some reward. Um, so this is the transition probability that we've seen and so the combination of that uh, together with, with the policy that you're following uh, that tells you what the value of a new state is, okay? So believe me now, and, it, and if you don't believe me, you can look it up. Uh, um, Bellman's equation, very famous equation, linking kind of state value function. Now, when we know this one, we can also talk about optimal value function, okay? And the optimal value function is related to the optimal policy, so the best policy that we can take. And that, for that one, we have Bellman optimality equation. So the only thing we need to change is that we're putting a max in there. So we're always trying to pick the best action, okay? And if we do that, then, and, and we follow uh, that particular policy, so always taking the best, best action, then we know we can compute what the optimal states are. Um, and, and sorry, what the, what the optimal values in a particular state are. And we have, in fact, the same type of equation as we had before, right? So this one that relates kind of the optimal value functions. So this is the optimal value function in a particular state to optimal value functions in another state, okay? And this is the transition function, this is the reward, and here we have to take the best possible action, okay? And here is this discounting factor that we, we've seen before. Okay, so the optimal value function in a particular state is related to optimal value functions at other states that are somehow linked with this transition probability here. Okay, so that's what you kind of should keep in mind. And then essentially what you have is a system of many equations because this S prime is also linked again to S and to all others and so on, right? So if I have a finite number of states, then in principle, I can try to solve this equation if I know what the rewards are and, and what the straight state probabilities are, and I can just solve that, right? So I don't need to do any reinforcement learning. And in fact, for the, for the robot in a room problem that we've seen, I don't really have to apply any reinforcement learning. I can just solve the Bellman optimal equation. And once I have kind of the optimal value functions, then it's relatively simple to also find the optimal policy, okay? So knowing the optimal value function, you can find the optimal policy. Right, and then you, you're basically using, uh, using this equation here. And, and this is what you get from there. Details, I, I, I won't have time to really go into that, but just to give you a flavor of uh, what Bellman's equation is and what Bellman optimality equation is and how this relates to optimal policies. Okay. Um, yeah, and then we go to reinforcement learning. So why do we need reinforcement learning? Well, because in some cases, well, in many interesting cases, we cannot solve Bellman's optimal equation, right? 
or Bellman's optimality equation. Because we have far too many states, far too many actions, there's just no way that we can solve that. So think about, again, the game of Go, right? So the, the board position is enormous. But look, I, I would even try to write them out, these, these, these sets of equations, impossible, right? So that's why we need reinforcement learning. So we have to try and explore kind of the space of all possible actions that I can take in all these different states that I can end up with, right? And then uh, the good ones, well, depends on the reward that you're gonna get. So that's what reinforcement learning is about. So at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is to solve Bellman's optimality equation, um, but we do that in this reinforcement learning model, okay? And then there are many different variants. So this is a picture that I found somewhere uh, where it's kind of a taxonomy of different reinforcement learning algorithms. You have on policy versus off policy, model free, model based, uh, policy based, or direct, which directly learns the policy, or you first learn the value function and then derive the policy. Uh, deep reinforcement learning, we'll say a few words about that. You have so called actor critic algorithms, self imitation learning, lots and lots of different uh, uh, tricks, you could say. So definitely you can fill a whole course, not just 45 minutes on reinforcement learning. So here is kind of one of the basic algorithms um, invented, I think, like 30 years ago. And most of the algorithms that are still around are some kind of variant of that. And so I derived from this Q learning algorithm. Okay, so what does it do? Um, well, it keeps track of this um, a Q as of A. So this, so what did we call that? The, uh, the state action value function, right? So the, the, the value function that depends not just on the state, but also on the action. Okay, so we're trying to kind of keep track of that. Um, so that's this Q here. And this is the update rule. So this is what we call a temporal difference. So we're going to look at the reward that we're going to get. So many times we're not going to get any reward, but hey, too bad. Then we're going to say, okay, so this is, if I take kind of the, the, the currently best action that I think is currently best, uh, if I'm going to take that one, and then hopefully I know what the Q is. Well, I keep track of those, so I should know that what the Q is in the state that I, I'm going to end up in. Um, so that's, that's this one. And then I'm going to compare that with the Q that I currently have, right? And if, if this one is now, if this one is now better, basically, right? This kind of improves, and I'm gonna make this a bit higher. And how much depends on this learning parameter, right? So, or, or update parameter. So that's similar to the learning parameters that you've seen probably for other learning algorithms. Okay, and this is this discount factor. So we're gonna check whether taking the action really helps us, right? And if it helps us, then we're gonna increase the state value function of this particular state with this particular action. If it doesn't, then maybe we're gonna lower it. Okay, so that's, that's the basic idea. And you can show and you can prove that if you do this often enough and you keep on doing that, blah, 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 lots and lots and lots of times, making all kinds of different actions and doing all kinds of different moves um, and, and keeping track of all these state action pairs, then you're, at the end of the day, you will, you will end up with the optimal solution of, of the Bellman optim, optimality equation, okay? However, you do have to update every pair of state and actions, and there can be many of them, right? So think of, again about game of Go. So a state was a board position. So you have to keep track of a table with all board positions and all actions that you're going to take there. So that's a lot. So th there is not feasible anymore, right? So the Q learning itself is based on keeping this, this whole table of state action pairs and updating this, this table all the time is not feasible for the problems that we're interested in, like playing Go and so on, and flying helicopters. So that's why, um, why we invented kind of new deep, deep reinforcement learning algorithms, as an example. So there are many new tricks, um, experience replay, curriculum learning, which means that you start with simple tasks and then you try to make them more complicated and so on. So, um, I cannot go into that, but it's a, it's a completely uh, um, a very uh, flourishing area of, of, of machine learning. So here is to, to tell you again what I just explained, right? So with Q learning, we try to, to take this table, we have this table of state, state action pairs here. 
state action pairs, and then we have to keep track of the values for each of those states. And we're going to update them all the time. Right? So we're going to make a move, and then we're going to update state action, well, the, the, the state action value from where I came from and, and the action that I made. And then I'm in a different position, and then I'm going to do a move again, and I'm going to update, and so on. We do this all the time, right? And then I got these Q values. So this is not going to work for really complicated problems. And so with deep Q learning, what I'm doing here is I'm taking the state as an input to a complex model. So you can take a neural network for that, or well, it's typically what we're doing these days, but you could also take another model for that. And then what I want to learn as output of this is the Q value of particular action, or maybe all actions that I can take in this particular state. Okay, so I'm, I'm making a model basically instead of keeping track of this whole table. So I'm plugging a model in, in between. So we call that model-based reinforcement learning. And this is what we would call model-free uh, reinforcement learning. I don't have any model for this Q function. Here, I'm putting a model in, in between, okay? So that's what we do in the uh, reinforcement learning. So here's an example that I want to show you, and then I'm basically done. So hopefully we still have some time for, for questions there. Um, so this was about learning uh, to play Atari games. I don't know if, if, you, if you've seen that so from like four or five years ago, even slightly more. So uh, the people at Google DeepMind, so they came up with this challenge, which is a really nice challenge. But these very old Atari games, right, that people tend to play on the computer. Uh, you don't play these anymore, but it's still fun. And um, so what they were trying to do is to make reinforcement learning strong enough to solve these games, right? So, so to learn how to play these games, but not knowing anything about what the game is really about, right? So only based on pixel information. So they would only show kind of the screen shots, basically, of this game, and then at the end, the reward that you get. So if you won, then you get a reward. If you if you didn't did not win, then you didn't get any reward, right? So you get you should see that you get all these images there, and then you get a reward. And then you get you you play another game, you get all these images, and you get a reward. And you get all these images, and you get a reward. Okay. And then based on that, you have to learn to play the game in a, in a good way. So here is um, what it looks like. Let me see if I can play this. Well, it should play. It never does. Oh, I guess I'm using my thing. Yeah, there we go. So this is a game called Breakout that, that is kind of playing. And uh, so you only got the sensory input, right? So you only got these images, which you can see on the on the screen, there is no kind of further information about what the game is about and things like that, right? And so at first, right, so what you have to, the, the control that you have is you, you can move this around. At first, it, it simply has to learn how to kind of make sure that the ball is not falling down, right? So to, um, to make sure that the ball stays in the game, basically. Um, And at some point, well, it does that, right? So this looks pretty good and it's pretty challenging, I guess, to do it in this way. Um, and then at some point, and it, it, this was the amazing part, it really learned a very clever strategy. So we didn't put this, well, they didn't put this in, right? It basically learned that. After four hours of training, they had really fast computers, so it doesn't really say anything, but anyway. Um, so this is what happens. What I do here, as you can see, oh, it's going to happen now. Okay, it stopped earlier than I thought it stopped. Uh, let me try again. No, let me not try again. So, so, so uh, you you could almost see it. So, what what it's going to do? It's 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 going to and you can watch um, other videos on, on, that on, on, on YouTube. It's gonna make kind of holes on the sides and then the, the ball's going there and then it's gonna kill kind of all the stones which are basically then 
below it. Right? So it's not going to try from 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 downstairs, but it's going to try from upstairs. To kind of re remove all the stones, here. and it works really well. So it's a strategy that humans may may not even think of, and it invented it uh, basically on its own. Okay, so here's the outlook. So reinforcement learning based on very little information, and the way it's it works and that you can still learn from this very little information is that you have to repeat it many, 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 many times, right? So you, if you want to learn a computer to play the game of Go, you need lots and lots of episodes. And the people at Google DeepMind, they can do that because they have lots of computers. They do lots of self-play, so play again, against a slightly later version of, of the same algorithm. And that's why you can solve these problems with reinforcement learning because you can generate lots and lots and lots of data. It's just maybe little information per game, just one bit, but because you can so play so many games, you still get lots of information. In real world problems, this is really a challenge, right? Because you cannot play these kind of games, right? So if you think about applying reinforcement learning in medicine, for example, you cannot try lots and lots of different strategies and see how many people survive, for example. That's not gonna work, right? So you have to do, with strategies that were applied in the real world and try to learn from that. So we call this off-policy, offline reinforcement learning. And I think the real challenge for the film is to go from kind of playing games to playing real world games, right? the games that we really care about, right? Which are not, well, I, we, I probably should not call those games, right? But reinforcement learning based on decisions that are, and rewards that you get in the real world and not in these kind of games. Because not so easy to, translate the success that we had in these all these different games to kind of real world problems. So there's a, a huge challenge and a really nice to, uh, to try and work on. Okay, so that was um, uh, what, I, what I had to say. So you will get some questions, uh, Mr. Fajar, right, on, 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 on this part. Um, so to check whether what I tried to explain was a bit clear. Um, yes, we already have some questions here. Okay. And the first one is. So let me unshare. Um, I can probably also see them. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can see them, but I cannot understand them. So. You no, not, not that one. Um, oh. It's private chat. I can read it for you. The first one is. Uh, It's in Bas Indonesia. I have to translate it first. Uh, is it applicable already for daily life problem, the reinforcement learning, and how much is the future of it? Like, I ever saw a commercial of fa tiny vacuum cleaner. Uh, it, it's automatic vacuum cleaner. Maybe is, is it already reinforcement learning embedded system or just AI, but something like that? What do you think, Professor? Definitely, so I, I, I'm a bit negative on, on, on the last slide because um, I, I think that sometimes they, they too easily make the, the step from, oh, see how, how we can solve these kind of games and now we're gonna go to real world problems. Um, and I think in real world problems, it's much harder to collect data, right? But there are definitely interesting real world problems like vacuum cleaning, like scheduling elevators and things like that, where you can, um, where you can somehow make your own software program. So you, we sometimes call that a digital twin that behaves exactly in the same way as the real elevators do, right? And then play lots of games with that and then optimize. It. So I think that's the way to go in, in many different cases. Right? So if you can make um, a software model or a digital twin of a real world problem, and then the reinforcement learning on that, that, that is a very good strategy for many problems and that you can probably also do for a vacuum cleaner and for um, elevator scheduling. But for some problems, you cannot really do that because the models that we have, the, the, the digital twins that we have are not good enough. So if I think about, for example, medicine and to try different strategies for how to handle patients with with COVID-19 right so you could you could phrase that as a reinforcement learning problem perfectly fine you can do that but then how do you collect your data 
right? So you're going to say, okay, if the patient is in this state, I'm going to try this action. I'm going to try this. Right? We can't. That might be unethical, right? So we're never going to get there. So the only thing there is very limited information of some actions that have been taken for patients in particular states, and then the results of that and the rewards, right? Whether they survive, so called earlier home or, or things like that, right? Or didn't get as sick as the other ones. Or, so, and then learn, and then learn, try and learn, learn from that. But to really translate the successes that we have, deep learning, um, uh, Q learning, for example, um, deep Q learning or, or things like that, the, the, the successes in games to successes in real world problems that we really care about, not so easy. It's a challenge, definitely. Yeah, everything has its own step, right? Yeah. And deep learning is not this famous. Uh, if there's no simple neural network, isn't it? We start at, as a simple one and then followed by complicated one. Uh, mm -hmm. We have another question actually, but it's already one and a half hours. How, how many questions do you, do you expect more? Hey, um, is it is okay it, for it, two more? I, yeah. No, yeah. So it's, so for me, I, anything goes, but I don't want to take too much of your time. Oh no, <laughs> it's your time. We consider most. Okay, uh, I don't. The, care. <laughs> the second question is, it's from our students. Um, do you have any idea what's the career for students when? the outcome career for the students when they already master, when they have some knowledge of machine learning or AI? Where do you think the career will be in the future when they graduate? Yeah, so to be completely honest, I, I, I don't know the situation in, in Indonesia that well, right? So I have to be a bit careful there. What I see a lot in, in the Netherlands that there are lots and lots of jobs for for data scientists and machine learning uh, wow. students um, at all kinds of different companies ranging from government to industry um, um, finances insurances um, we have a lot of lots and lots of students working in um, in the energy business for example with with big energy companies um, trying to make predictions of um, I don't know uh, energy consumption, but also uh, uh, wind for 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 green energy. Uh, so so yeah. So people who can handle data and really big data sets really well, um, quite easily find a job at least within within the Netherlands. And I I would expect the same more or less in Indonesia, um, because those would be very different, right? So um, so but for me, machine learning. Uh, it's kind of one of the tools in the big toolbox of, of how to handle data. So kind of standard statistics is also important, right? So and in some cases, uh, standard statistics is just good enough. And in some cases, it's very good to apply more complicated machine learning models. And um, so if, if I think about kind of the deep learning, which is so popular these days, if you, if you say, yeah. well, I have a job in deep learning, then it's much more limited, right? Then you're limited to uh, companies that have a lot of problems in, in um, uh, for example, image recognition um, or speech, speech recognition, text analysis. Right? So in these areas, you have a lot of deep learning, uh, but in other areas, it's more kind of standard machine learning that people apply a lot. And more and more, I, I, I see a bright future for machine learning students, definitely. Yeah, thank you. And I think this is the last question from me. <laughs> from your slide number 15, I guess, the title is The Challenges of Reinforcement, Reinforcement Learning. We, you mentioned about exploration and exploitation. Do they kind of independent or in some cases we can mix them? For example, when I travel from home to my office, I can I can do much on exploration, completely random. But 
it will actually somehow get stuck in a traffic jam more the possibility will get more chance to me to get there the, rather than i do exploitation by doing what my experience already have so the best thing the best way i guess is to do by mixing oh in from this way to that way i can use my experience and from that point i can try another route for increasing my knowledge is it also possible in here to do mix uh, exploitation explore and exploration yeah that definitely so that's definitely possible so um so if you really want to do it that way no so let me first explain that typically what you do in reinforcement learning is that in the beginning you do a bit more exploration than at the end right so at the end when you already know that you have a pretty good solution you do do more exploit exploitation so you're always trying to take the best action in the beginning you you try to wander around a bit more okay um if you feel that you somehow decompose your your problem in into different uh, sub problems right so for, so going from here to here and then from there to there and then from there to there right so that you oh. you step into pieces then you can follow different strategies for each of the pieces so you can do that yeah but so that to task reinforcement learning or or it's not um so but then you have to break it into pieces first yeah. oh, oh okay that's why i get the idea yeah so there's one more question in the chat that I can read. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, Does reinforcement learning work for changing yes. the world of okay? So at different obstacles on each resource. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay. Yeah. So so if the if the environment is not constant, right, and and if the you know, environment can also change, it becomes more and more challenging, definitely. Um, uh, but I think you can somewhat handle that because because it, but the statistics should there should be some statistical component in there right so if you think about going to work in the uh, traffic jams are not always the same every day right but yeah. it needs to be that what you what you um encountered in the past right so the experience that you got in the past does tell you something about what what might happen in the future so the statistics should hold actually right so you should be able to your experience and it should correspond to what you will see in the future if that does not happen then i don't i don't know because i don't know how to basically handle that so it doesn't have to be always exactly the same but the statistics kind of the higher level statistics should be more or less the same because otherwise there's nothing i can learn from okay so that's and it's more challenging so it does affect the learning time definitely so if it changes if, if the environment changes then um you need more time. Yeah. It's basically, of, basically like learning how to ride a bike, isn't it? By by more time, we gain more experience how to balance it. Perhaps by reinforcement learning, we can also teach how a robot to ride a bike in the future. Well, so 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 bike is very similar to to this um, kind of prototypical problem of of pole balancing, right? Oh, so that, yeah, yeah, that's why. It's a very good old uh, reinforcement problem. Um, so yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, thanks the, for the explanation. Okay. okay. So, I guess that's all for the Q&A session. I will return this session to our host, Ms. Rismiati. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Papa Jar. Do you want to have photo session together with everyone before I close this session? Maybe we should ask everyone to open their uh, yes. video so that we can have yeah, some sort of photo session, virtual photo session. This is an important session of all i guess oke okay, semuanya bisa minta tolong dinyalakan videonya ya yuk please ya yeah, mas pilih 
Masih unforkom tuh. Masih unforkom. Kelihatan deh. Gak apa-apa. Kelihatan deh. Oke. Ini yuk. Mas Anang atau saya yang ini? Uh, Mas Anang, tolong. Wow, nice to see you all actually. <laughs> great to see That's so great many people. Uh, okay, sudah dikasih apa apa mungkin. Mas Anang, can you do the screen capture? Eh, bisa screen capture enggak? Enggak bisa. Oh. Boleh, boleh Bu Rizmi, karena kalau host nggak bisa. Okay. Let me try. Oke, okay. for the first page, uh, give your best smile. One, two, three. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me check first. I have poor lighting here. Oke, okay, second page. Uh, second page. Yeah, we have Mas Rizky by Hakis. Up to Yudi Tondang here. One, two, three. Smile. Oke, okay. hold on, let me check first. Third page. Well, we have a lot here. Oke, okay. nah, halaman ketiga nih. Yang belum nyala di halaman ketiga, Zaim, Zulfa. Mati, mati, mana mati? Tadi hilang, ya ketutup. Ya, kelihatan. Aulia. Mau lihat apa? Oke, okay, satu, Abdul Hakim, uh, udah ganti. Satu, dua, tiga. Ideally, is every page. <laughs> There are lots. How many pages do you have? Oke, okay, uh, the fourth page, uh, no one showed up at the fourth page. Uh, ada. Masih ada nggak? Oh. Uh, ya. Yeah. Okay. Fourth page is already... Uh, They are shy. They are very shy. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I think that's all for the photo session. Yeah. Feel free to keep turning on the video. It's, it's, not, it's so nice to see everyone's face today. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fajar and Professor Tom for today's event. It's a very interesting uh, lecture. I hope to learn more about this, actually, because for this reinforcement learning, we only have, like, uh, two to three hours to cover, so we do not really have much time to cover in the class. Okay, distinguished guests, fellow colleagues and students, uh, we have come to the end of today's session. Uh, on behalf of Department of Informatics, I would like to extend our gratitude to everyone who has joined us, especially Professor Tong, who has uh, given us such an interesting lecture. And of course, uh, We hope to see you in the future visiting professor program from Department of Informatics. And last but not least, for our student, uh, don't forget to do your quiz, the second quiz at 5 p.m., okay? Uh, there will be a gift by Mr. Adi Wibowo. Uh, the winner will be announced on Friday, right, Mr. Adi Wibowo? Yeah. Maybe he will give voucher, OVO or GoPay, I don't know. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, see you on another session. Uh, good afternoon uh, and see you. Thank you, Professor Tom. See you Thank on you, Friday. Tom. Thank Friday. you, everyone. Makasih semuanya. Sampai ketemu minggu depan ya di kelas.